I'm going to begin by reading from my first book called Rooks, which focuses on my freshman year at Pennsylvania Military College. And the title comes from the, the uh, pejorative term that upperclassmen call the freshman, which was Rooks. Soul music. Holed up in my barracks bunker, I tune my radio to WDAS, one of Philly's three soul stations. My military bearing melting to the heat of Sam and Dave's I'm Coming, Jackie Wilson's Baby Workout. Too uptight to use the hallway latrine, I fear running into an upperclassman who on a lark might ask me to stare at a wool crack for an hour, kiss the floor for a dozen push-ups, sound off by memory military regs. Any stray facial motion, yawn, tick, or spasm can be interpreted as quibbling, attitude, disobedience, resulting in a deluge of demerit slips, followed by punishment tours, hour-long marches in parking lots, work details, weekend restrictions. So I urinate in a coffee can, hide out in my room snapping my fingers to Shirley Ellis's The Real Nitty Gritty, Coco Taylor's Wing Dang Doodle. One evening I empty my can out the window and a series of violent knocks convulses the third quarter of Howell Hall. I lower the volume to the wicked pickets I'm a midnight mover as Lieutenant Colonel Michael Hunter goes from door to door, his service cap and jacket shiny with wet patches. Yeah. <laughs> and this, this next poem was about a, an incident that made me a celebrity for a while at, at PMC. Night of the Hot Hoagie. <laughs> Every night, chest out, face shiny, Brigade Sergeant Samuel L. Silverman bursts into my room, 10 p.m., hunger hour, while I stand, eyes forward, gut in, shoulders back, quivering like I have palsy. Sergeant Silverman sniffs around for a Philly-style hoagie sandwich, cheesesteak, shrimp, salad, hamburger, Italian. He opens drawers, looks in coat pockets, lifts up blankets and sheets. When he finds a hoagie, confiscates hair, half, declaring R-H-I-P. Rank has its privileges as the big knot in his throat works itself up and down and half my precious sandwich disappears down his gullet. <laughs> Fed up with being ripped off, I order an Italian flamethrower from Fran and Ann's hoagie shop. Prosciutto, salami, provolone, all three layers larded with Tabasco, Louisiana hot sauce, and cherry peppers. The next evening, Sergeant Silverman burst into my room, picking up the scent of hoagie. I make no attempt to hide it. After the first few bites, Sarge roars and runs off to the latrine, where he latches his lips around the cold water faucet. Yeah. <laughs> next, I'm going to read a few poems from Blanquito and El Barrio, which translates roughly as a white boy in Spanish Harlem. Sweet streams in Spanish Harlem. The snow cone cellar's wooden cart lies on its side along Third Avenue. Its shiny turquoise paint showing the footprint of the cop who kicked it over for unregulated business practice. Out of the mouths of broken bottles, syrupy streams of purple, green, and orange inch their way across the sidewalk towards the Colosso Furniture Store where beds collapse upon human contact. <laughs> For those who might not know, cuchifritos are, are fritters um, that are very popular in the Latin American community that can be made out of potato, fish, meat. Cuchifritos. I had to sizzle in my chisel for Nilsa dug her big eyes, moist, meaty lips, coloring curves like sculptured, sculpted teak wood. One night I took her to Papo's Cuchifritos. She'd been playing hard to get all summer long, and I figured a belly full of spicy pig parts and fritters might open her up to other bodily pleasures. <laughs> I'd eaten cuchifritos once before after a night of blowing weed and tossing down Bacardi with Manny and Count, the former president and warlord of a local street gang. 
We had our own social worker, Count boasted. We'd finished harmonizing such doo-wop classics as Desiree, Wind, and Gloria under the archway of the Park Avenue L when Count pulled out a wad of bills. Birthday money, he claimed, and said, let's grit it, Papos, a cuchifrito joint on 116th Street. Beneath blazing light bulbs over front window metal bins, Count pointed to orejas, rabitos, morcillas, acapurias, pastelillos, rellenos de papa. Juggling white cardboard boxes, dripping cooking oil, we sat on car fenders and ate pig's ears, pigtails, blood sausages, fritters, and meat-filled potato balls. The swagger of that night stayed with me as Nils and I walked in the papos and cop squats on steel shiny stools. I pointed to a half a dozen bins and soon cuchifritos were piled high in front of us. Before I could pick up a fork, Nilsa grabbed a fire red bottle and bathed the bacalaito, codfish fritter, with hot sauce devouring it in three bites. Then she picked up the tip of her oreja and began to chew on the rubbery cartilage, her teeth making loud crunching sounds. <laughs> Next she chowed down on two blood sausages, thick and black as a policeman's club. Then she picked up a fried pig's tail and ate it like an ice cream cone, strips of pork sticking out the side of her mouth, lips a blaze of yellow grease. I sat quietly nibbling on a potato ball. <laughs> What's the matter? No tiene hambre? You're not hungry? I smiled as a drum roll by Tito Puente blasted from the jukebox, Nilsa keeping time by tapping her knife against the side of the water glass. Wow. <laughs> So my, uh, I'm going to also read a couple poems from my chapbook, Surfs of Psychiatry, which is inspired by my working as a therapy aide for 12 years at Bronx Psychiatric Center. Wow. And, uh, and this, was, uh, <laughs> this was inspired by a patient that I took care of for many years. Marty. He'd been on Ward 11 since the loony bin was built back in the 50s. Bald, with a flattened nose and two banks of rosy red gums, Marty stood with one dead arm dangling, his lips moving soundlessly after decades of being overprescribed phenothiazines. He had big breasts and bitty balls and would pop his cork by laying on his belly and kicking himself in the butt with the back of his feet. I'd say, he'd say, sweet juice, and smile sometimes after he washed down his meds with an extra cup of cherry Kool-Aid. Otherwise, the only sound that would come out of his mouth was something that sounded like a kuchula, which one nurse said was shim talk for, I'll cut your head off. <laughs> a kuchula was Marty's war cry, and his two weapons were his bull pate, which he thrust like a battering ram, and his sole functioning fist, which he swung like a battle axe. A kuchala, he'd say, and all the loon keepers would scramble, and after a down and dirty worthy of a man with four healthy limbs, Marty would be dragged off to the quiet room where several sets of eyeballs would watch him laying on the dirty rubber mattress, kicking himself in the butt with the back of his feet. The Looney Leap. The day Yvonne came on the ward, she opened her mouth wide and asked if she could shine my shaft, her tongue long and skinny as a lizard's tail. I tried to ice her hungry stares, but a day later she grabbed my groin, and from then on, to protect my jewels, I did a funny pivot, crossing my legs in midair whenever I passed her. I grew, I grew used to her snapping hands, her taunting tongue, and my co-workers called my defensive dancing the loony leap which, while they sung the tune, Here We Go loop de loo <laughs> On the evening I heard Yvonne was about to be transferred, I loosened my stride, squeezing through the crazies, leaving the dining room. I was carrying a stack of trays high over my head when I saw Yvonne's face break into a smile, her hand closing in on my manhood. <laughs> and finally, I'm going to read a couple poems from Stone Walls, which is my latest uh, book of poetry. 
that it focuses on my relationship with my father in Stanford, Connecticut, where I grew up. And I have copies of this for sale if anybody's interested, as well as my other books. Oh, I am. Good. Dad was a businessman. And his solution to anything I asked was, it's whatever the market will bear. Why are prisons filled with colored people? Why have presidents only been men? Why are the Marines in Laos and Panama? Why are people eating out of garbage cans? Why do we have 70,000 nuclear warheads? Why do people die in emergency rooms waiting to be seen by a doctor? It's whatever the market will bear. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and this was inspired by a poem called, I believe it was called Central, uh, Grand Central by Billy Holiday that was kind of ubiquitous. Billy Collins. Billy Collins, I'm sorry. That was kind of ubiquitous and I felt kind of provoked about it so I wrote my own Grand Central poem. I meet Dad high on heroin at the information booth with the four-faced clock at Grand Central Station. He's 57 at the top of his corporate game. Promotion to director, Foxy secretary, executive suite office in the Empire State Building. Dad pays for my train ticket. We sleep all the way to Stanford. Exiting the commuter parking lot, he eyes me. You don't look right. It's hay fever season, I mumble. <laughs> Cigarette singeing his suit jacket. And this is my last poem. Part of this was set in the Philadelphia area. The Refuse Nick. When Dad worked as a purchasing agent, he recalled how salesmen offered him bribes, cash, Broadway theater tickets, vacations in the Caribbean in exchange for their business. I told people I admired him for his integrity, but inside a voice sneered, square, dope, for refusing whatever perks came his way. Once while returning from lunch, a pipe dropped from a skyscraper, grazing Dad's forehead. He struggled to stay conscious while colleagues led him to a doctor who said he was lucky to be alive and urged him to seek legal counsel. My father refused, saying it was wrong to sue for damages when he wasn't really hurt. I shrugged my shoulders, but inside a voice hissed, fool, goody goody, who in their right mind turns down free money? <laughs> Years later, I sat in a car with friends, green in the gills on Gallo Port in bogus Acapulco Gold, when a tow truck ran a red light and plowed into our passenger side. The driver sat dazed while I tumbled out the, front, the crumpled door and stuffed wine bottles and a hash pipe down a sewer drain. We found an attorney, fresh out of law school, who said a lack of injuries never stood in the way of a big payday and sent us to orthopedists and surgeons who never treated us. We each made 700 bucks. A year later, I used my money to buy my girlfriend a ruby cluster heart ring for Valentine's Day while I was rehabilitating in a drug program my father refused to visit. Whoa.